Dear friends, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, this uh, Friday afternoon in, in August. We will have a wonderful webinar today discussing about Inside China, a supply side solution laid out on China 14 five years plan. Uh, we is not the first time that as a chamber we are uh, discussing and studying uh, the 14 five years plan. And we decide also uh, that this is a top level policy blueprint, the lays foundation for the next phase of policy focus and development goal. China five years plan have always been a great interest to multinational businesses operating in China. In fact, the highest number of uh, attendees to this uh, webinar explain the interest of uh, our members in the 14 five years plan. And I like previous plan, the 14 five years plan mark a shift away from the quantitative uh, targets and uh, push more to the new development stage that is the favor of self-sufficiency. Today, at our latest edition of the Chamber long running macroeconomic series inside China, which I am delighted today to moderate, we have uh, the pleasure to welcome uh, our old friend, Mrs. Uh, Dan Wang, who used to work as the Economist Intelligence Unit and now is the Chief Economist of Hang Seng Bank China. Thank you for being here and congrats for your new position. It's her first time to speak at the Chamber event in her new position and we are delighted to have you here once again. And indeed, let me welcome uh, old friend, Mr. Longchen, which is uh, the co-founder and partner of Plenum. He has extensive knowledge in terms of China, politics and economy. economy. Already in Shanghai, in a couple of months ago, we had uh, a really spicy, let me say like this, discussion on the 14 five years plan. And now I would like to give uh, the floor to Ms. Dan Wang, that uh, will tell us uh, some insight on the 14 5 year plan or supply side solution. And after we will have uh, an interesting model which will be a dialogue among our experts, which will be also open to question to our members. Please uh, remember to move to yourself. And uh, if you have any question, raise your hand and write it down in the chat box. Dan, Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, hi, uh, hello everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here and share with you my understanding of China's 14 years plan and what's going to happen beyond uh, 2025. So I want to start from this question, how's China's economy doing right now? If we look at the macro data in the past few, in the past few months, the trend was more or less similar. The overall recovery was pretty fast, especially in industrial production. Um, and the export and the import figures are quite good. Uh, usually the growth on average was between 20 to 30%. And with the United States, it's usually between 50 to 60%. That's quite extraordinary. Um, but there are a lot, a lot of concerns. And the biggest one is consumption. So if we look at this chart on the left hand side, uh, I think this is more or less a horror story to me because from bottom to top, that is China's tier one, tier two, uh, tier three and four cities combined. That's the black portion, uh, that's a tier three and four. So in a normal year, uh, like 2019, the tier three and four cities combined usually account for more than 50% of China's retail market. But you can see after COVID in 2020, tier three and four retail share are shrinking quite rapidly. 
it was 48% in 2020, and in quarter one of 2021, that's 47%. And in the first half, mostly in June, it recovered a bit more, but still it's far from uh, what's normal before COVID. And this is quite uh, incredible to me because when we look at China's retail market, many people are thinking about uh, doing the mass market, but now it looks like the consumption in small cities and also employment in small cities are having trouble. And the rebooting of the consumption outside China's largest cities have been very difficult. Uh, it is quite alarming when we look at some of the third party data um, because for China's unemployment rate, uh, the National Bureau of Statistics only do survey for urban region. They don't survey the rural area unemployment rate, but we can look at the migration patterns. And the last year, about 5 million rural migrants have returned to uh, the county and the village area. And this year, not many of them have returned to large cities. So this trend is very likely to continue given that the services industry in urban regions are not recovering that fast, especially in catering and retail. So uh, Zhang Dandan from Beijing University has, uh, um, has a survey for um, dozens of counties in China. And what she found was that 12% of the workers had been unemployed for some time in 2020, and the duration averaged four months of unemployment. And this year, it doesn't look like the situation has improved any, uh, has improved in a significant way. Uh, what's more worrying is this zero tolerance attitude after the recent resurgence of COVID. Especially, it is a big hit to um, the, the economy in the South. And when we compare China's consumption to other countries, um, the difference is even starker. Um, for example, with the US, the US consumption was about 20% higher than the pre-COVID level. That's the data from the first half of the year. And for China, this number is only 8% higher. And most of the increase is concentrated in large cities and dominantly in tier one cities. And that's why we see this really flourishing market in luxury, but not so much when it comes to the lower end consumer goods. Um, the difference also comes from the policy priority because the US and the Europe usually would subsidize the consumer first to guarantee the demand recovery. But for China, the subsidies and help are usually targeting companies. And that is on the one hand to guarantee employment so that um, the local government can maintain a stable society and also to guarantee a relatively steady tax flow. Um, the domestic demand has been quite weak. Uh, the real estate market is the only bright spot. And beyond that, there is really not much demand. So I think uh, it is safe to say that the domestic recovery is picking up pace, but demand is seriously lagging behind supply. And um, there is one trend emerging quite strongly, that is the constraint from the supply side. Uh, of course, we all know that the biggest source of this uh, supply side bottleneck is in shipping. Uh, many of the companies have to turn down new orders since even if they uh, make the goods, they cannot ship them out in time. And the shipping price index have been getting higher and higher and there is really no sign of the shipping price coming down anytime soon. So I think this trend probably will last well into uh, the first quarter of next year. And the second bottleneck for China's um, supply constraint is in terms of the domestic restrictive policies. And this is in the background of uh, the climate change, uh, the so-called strong time policy. Uh, so carbon emission, uh, cutting carbon emission is a priority for many of the local governments. And there has been this campaign style of carbon cutting. Um, and commodity price is another constraint since it has pushed up the production costs for many of the exporting, uh, exporting factories. 
So we haven't seen a very enthusiastic investment in the manufacturing sector. So what, what this has implicated is that uh, the domestic constraints in supply would eventually push up the inflation in other countries, especially in the US, because for the US imports, actually China only accounts for about 15%, but among the US consumer goods, China's export is a dominant composition. So when we compare China's export price and the US consumer inflation, they are highly correlated. Um, for domestic inflation, the pressure is also high, but it's not that much uh, due to a relatively weak domestic demand. So I don't think that China has immediate inflation pressure. Uh, it was only 1% in July. And I've heard many people talking about China may face a stagflation, but the stagnation may be a little bit. Inflation pressure is not really there. It's, it's, when we talk about inflation, it's usually the consumer price inflation. It's usually not uh, the producer price inflation. So uh, the transmission mechanism hasn't been very strong since 2014. And this year, it's not that different. Uh, it's not that different. The increase in the raw material cost is mostly absorbed by the producers, not consumers. Um, this is where I think China's economy is at. And then the next question is, where is China going in the next five years? So that's the 14th five-year plan. We can get a sense by looking at some of the details in this plan. It is quite special to me because I've been following the, uh, the, the five-year plan for about uh, 15 years. That's like three of, uh, three of them. And this time, of course, it's the only time that China doesn't have a growth target. Um, but that's not the most significant difference. Um, to me, the biggest difference this time is how much it has stressed self-sufficiency. Uh, the reason is um, relatively clear because um, the relationship between China and the U.S. has worsened significantly in the past five years. So to guarantee the economic security, this plan really highlighted three areas from the supply side. Um, and they are industrial supply chain security, food security, and energy security. Um, when we look at uh, the self-sufficiency, uh, this word, it in fact entails a lot of things. Uh, and many people would think about technology. Uh, they would think about the domestic market, uh, the huge potential in consumer market especially, and also in terms of adding more regulation. And that is part of uh, establishing rule of law in China. Um, doing business in China has always have to suffer this policy uncertainties. It's just part of the deal when you want to do business in China. And China had been criticized for creating this many gray areas that has made the rules not as transparent as what people want to see. So now there's an, a whole different situation that regulators in fact are competing to add more regulations. Um, and that has caused a lot of chaos, but still, I think that's part of the plan for China to strengthen its supply side, uh, a supply side position. Um, so let's look at the supply chain security first. Uh, the technology is absolutely the core focus of the plan on um, the semiconductor, especially uh, has the highest priority. There have been massive capital investment. Um, there are policy support. Uh, there are a lot of plans to help talents to um, settle in big, uh, big uh, universities in China. Uh, and the state-backed R&D in the coming five years is expected to grow by about 7% a year. And that is a lot faster than China's potential GDP growth rate. Uh, there was this new paper issued by the central bank, and the estimate is that during the 14th five-year plan period, 
China's potential growth rate annually is between 5 and 5.5%. Um, stock market is directed to support this goal. Although there are a lot of, of antitrust movement and deregulation um, addition, but it is to me only to tighten the leash for the largest companies, but not to suppress the high tech or digital economy in general, since China need to lay the foundation for its digital economy in the, in the coming 20 years, adding more standards, more clear rules to the data market is a good thing. It is just that when we look at the long-term vision, it's relatively clear. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day regulation and who's adding that regulation and where's the next step, uh, it is quite chaotic. Um, that's probably just part of uh, the price that companies have to pay when they, um, when they operate in China. And some people say this is to break some eggs in order to make omelet or uh, constructive disruption, uh, disruption. I think they all make some sense. Um, but the bottom line is, I think the recent changes in regulation is quite consistent with what the Chinese government want, want to achieve in the long term. Um, then when we look at the food security problem, uh, it is quite interesting that in this 14th five-year plan, um, it is the first time that food security was elevated to such a level. There are a lot of the misunderstandings in the market about whether China is facing a food crisis. Um, because I, uh, my postdoc was in agriculture, so I do think I have some credentials to talk about the food security. It doesn't look to me that China is facing immediate or long-term food security problem or food shortage problem. Uh, in fact, after COVID, when um, the pandemic have disrupted the normal production schedule, China's green output hit another record. And there were a lot of flexibilities, in fact, in the system to increase food supply, uh, especially when it comes to stable grains. Uh, we know that Jiangxi has been historically a main producer for rice. It used to produce about 20 years ago, it used to produce mostly like double cropping rice. But then uh, in late 2000s, people found it more profitable to plant uh, one season of rice and in the off season to raise crayfish. You know how much Chinese people love crayfish and farmers make more money that way. But after COVID, in order to increase uh, the rice supply to stabilize the market, uh, the farmers have switched back to double cropping or even triple cropping. So the system has a lot of leeways. And on top of that, the national reserve in China for staple grains is quite excessive. And when we look at the chart on the right-hand side, um, for staple grain, on average, China can sustain about nearly, uh, on average, about one year of supply in wheat, corn, rice. Um, but for most countries, this number is around three months. And that's by international standards safe enough. But for China, there's a vivid memory of the famine in the 1950s. And then um, there's some worry that if we import a lot of staple grains, then that will be too much dependence on major exporters like the US or Australia. So the self-sufficiency in food has always been a priority in China. Um, one interesting element though in this plan is the highlight of seed security. This is quite a new concept introduced by central government in late 2020. And it's very, very similar to the strategy in developing chips. Um, because for the chip industry, the guiding principle is that Chinese companies should, should eventually use Chinese uh, China-made chips. And for Chinese food, they should use Chinese seeds. Right now, the staple grains in China are almost all using uh, Chinese 
own as a China, China produ uh, seeds produced in China, Chinese seeds. But when it comes to vegetables, fruits, and especially breeding animals, they are highly uh, dependent on foreign supplies, especially from Australia and Europe. And this has created some problems for the Chinese government because whenever there's a problem in geopolitics, agriculture is usually the first thing uh, being hit, uh, especially uh, in animal, tr uh, animal trade uh, and some of the large commodities like soybeans. So China wants to reduce its dependence for foreign countries in agricultural technology. Uh, there will be the COP15 conference in Kunming. Uh, I think it will happen maybe November, December this year, um, but it has been delayed several times. So the effort is to increase China's biodiversity in order to elevate the research capacity in biotech. Although it's not specified in the plan, uh, the genetic modification, the GM crops, is probably the most important biotechnology in the seed industry. Uh, if we look at the official data, for the past 10 years, China has invested more than 20 billion uh, RMB in the GM varieties um, research and development. But these investments have only been restricted to research without reaching the commercialization stage, uh, mostly due to a strong opposition from consumers. Chinese consumers are very similar to the European consumers in this regard. They have uh, this strong sense of eating things that are natural. Although they're not really scientific, not enough scientific evidence that GM crops have long-term harm, can cause long-term harm to human, but Chinese consumers are really against it. Uh, also, there was some big push from celebrities like Cui Yongyuan uh, a decade ago. He's quite influential in this anti-GM uh, movement. Uh, nonetheless, the commercialization of the GM foods will likely to accelerate in the coming five years because it is really the foundation for the next breakthrough of China's agricultural productivity. So far in China, if you're, if you're using Chinese cotton or eating Chinese papaya, these are all GM. Um, but for corns, they are not supposed to be GM, but they are. Yes, when I was doing my postdoc dissertation in Chinese Academy of Sciences, one of my colleagues was doing research for uh, corns in Northeast region in China. That was in 2016. And what he found was that it was illegal to plant GM corn crops, but people are doing it, farmers are doing it. Uh, it has high yield. You don't need to use as much pesticide. Um, but he didn't get to publish his dissertation because those seeds were smuggled. They were, they were made by Monsanto. So that's the, that's the year when China-US tension was rising, the trade war started. So he couldn't get that paper published for the longest time until I think late last year. Um, but many of the agricultural experts believe that the corn will be the next in line for commercial cultivation of GM crops. And then um, the last element, I think very important is uh, this energy security. Uh, the focus is the green energy transition. Um, it has been China's most important industrial policy in the past few years, um, but it has been quite difficult because we have seen that there are pushback from certain industries uh, since say the commodity price is very high, production cost is too high. And the local governments have been issuing carbon emission quota or doing more of a capacity, capacity cutting for polluting sectors. This process has been quite difficult. And Shanghai has launched the carbon trade platform uh, in late July. It was delayed several times as well. The transaction of the carbon trade has been quite small on this platform. Um, and that is a reflection of the difficulty to push this forward. Most of the companies and factories in China are not aware of even how to calculate carbon emission. 
So uh, everything is still in this infancy stage, and um, there will be some strong push from the government. Um, one positive side from this climate change policy uh, is that we see all corporates are getting quite serious about ESG, um, about carbon emission in their own industries. So in the future, there will be real legal cost or compliance cost. So it is probably better and every, every uh, company, every industry, including my company is a bank, all realize the importance to comply earlier than later because just from a um, government relation perspective, probably it's better to do, uh, to make some early actions. Um, for the long-term trend of China, we should also try to understand uh, some of the most important data sets. And to me, now the most important one is the seven census. And two big themes from the census to me is one about population growth, the other one about urbanization. The population growth was a lot slower than many people had hoped. Um, that means aging is faster. Um, aging in itself is not a big problem really for China's labor market because otherwise um, unemployment would be a bigger problem. So when we look at the job ap applications right now in urban China, there's usually a age cap for, um, for some of the best jobs, you know, like the IT industry, financial industry, or uh, even uh, being uh, being employed by universities, the age cap is normally 35. Um, and the retirement age is almost insanely low for Chinese women. So there's a difference between Yu Ganbuen and Yu Goren. So female cadre and female worker, for female cadre, it can retire at 55, but for female workers, you can retire as early as 50 or even 45. So when I think about this, there is a huge waste in China's human capital. Uh, like I spent about a decade in grad school uh, and also in my postdoc. So after I graduated, I'm done with all the studies. Then I can only work for any industry for about 10 years, then I may retire if I'm considered a female worker. So there are, by saying that, I'm saying there's a lot of leeway for China to increase its human capital without having, um, without asking people to have a lot more babies. And of course, the birth rate in China now is already very low. There might be some rebound the next year, but still the government target is to raise that beyond 1.6, 1.7, or even two. And that's extremely difficult. Um, another trend for, from the seven census is in urbanization. Because the urbanization is a lot faster than what we had expected. And the implication can be quite significant. For example, in the housing market, um, the housing price have been increasing really high in the past decade. And probably one reason is because that the urbanization was happening too fast. So the housing market in the future may peak too early. And that's not necessarily good news for especially real estate developers. Um, but then the implication for future policy to me is a refocus on the county level economy or the small city economy. Uh, there are a lot of policy debate on whether China should develop large city clusters or a more of a balanced growth between regions. Um, there are different arguments depending on uh, where you think China's growth will come from in the future. But it just looks like that it is really better to make people become the middle class in small cities and counties rather than the low income class in the largest cities. And for China's 14th five year plan, it wants to increase the quality of people's life. And that means maybe a more balanced growth like common prosperity would be a priority rather than to develop the most productive area in China. Uh, like um, the Yangtze River integrated area to make that area even bigger. I don't think it will expand as fast as 
what many people have thought. Um, and the old urbanization uh, model versus the new urbanization model, to me, I, I summarize in those two words, uh, in those two expressions. Um, the old urbanization in China was the one without people because it was mostly financed by land. So local government sell land, try to build as fast as they can. So that's why we hear a lot of those ghost cities. Uh, eventually, many of the so-called ghost city were filled with people, like the um, Guiyang area uh, or Erdo uh, Si. Uh, um, but the new model, in a way, is probably even a bigger challenge for government and for, for the newcomers in the city, because um, the economic growth is slowing down. And for rural, uh, for rural workers, if they had any skills, they probably have already moved to countries or cities. Um, for those who were left behind, they probably don't have the modern skill to match a good job in the city. So how to create enough positions in the future when China is aiming for 75 or 80% urbanization by 2035, um, that will be a big challenge for the local government. And lastly, uh, I, want to, um, I want to emphasize this one point that China's economy has a lot of challenges, but it may have started a new upward cycle. Uh, this is um, not a wishful thinking because there are at least three main drivers for this upward cycle. One is China's own business cycle. Uh, we know that around 2015, there was a big push to cut old capacity, polluting capacity. And in 2019, there was this campaign of deleveraging. So that is to cut debts for local governments and for SOEs. And this COVID is in fact another round of cutting old capacity. So whoever is left is probably the most efficient companies and sectors. And reflected in stock market is quite obvious because the best companies in China are getting better on their profit margin, their returns, and also the money they can attract is getting better. Um, and the second reason uh, is from uh, the external push. Um, there has been this global monetary easing, especially from Europe and the US. Um, so much money in the world flooding into different industries, it will push the economy into a new phase. Um, people are talking about the US monetary policy being tightened quite soon, but it's, its monetary policy might be tightened on the margin, but the fiscal expansion has only just started. We all know that the infrastructure plan um, by Biden, and he wants to expand that to an even larger scale. So all those money flood into the capital market, they will find the best, uh, the best companies. Uh, in the late Nine, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a huge bubbles in the capital market. But that's also the time when we saw the creation of some of the best companies like Alibaba, like Tencent. They were all created during that bubble, a bubble, um, bubble era. Um, so to, in order to create the best companies, sometimes we do need some bubbles in especially the internet economy. And the third reason is that China is getting into this new technological cycle. Um, and many people compare where China is at now to uh, the recovery period after 2008. I actually think China is more like um, the period in late 1990s. That's when the internet era just started. And this time, the driver is mainly from the digital economy, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, things like that. And China's position is also fundamentally different from the 1990s. Back then, it was mostly like a copycat story. 
But now China in some area can compete with the best companies and, and the most advanced countries in the world, like AI, industrial robots, 5G. So in the long term, when we look at a country's growth potential, it is um, usually four, uh, four factors, that is uh, labor, capital, technology, and land, and now maybe adding in data. So China is quite lagging in terms of technological innovation, but in terms of technology application, it is quite advanced, especially in terms of the market and the data application. So we know that the forecast for China in the coming five years would be quite rosy. Usually people will give about 5.5 um, to 6% annual growth rate. And it's likely for China to become the largest economy by 2030. But for everyone, it doesn't matter if you are a domestic company or foreign investors, it's going to be a lot more difficult to make money in China um, because of the establishment of the rule of law. So by adding more of those regulations, um, it is limiting the ability that uh, many companies can take advantage in. And if you want to do a successful business in China, it is equally important to help Chinese government to achieve its social goals uh, instead of just chasing profits. Um, and as a result, just on the macro level, I think China's economic division between different regions would also increase because a lot of those old traditional polluting industries are in the north, uh, in inland, and a lot of the new economies are concentrated in the south. So in the coming five to 10 years, we'll see a bigger divergence in most markets between the north and south. It doesn't matter if it's housing, manufacturing or services, and more people will go down uh, to South China. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, really interesting uh, presentation, and especially also to respect the, the time and the timing that we agreed uh, together. This is really important <laughs> for us. Well done. And now I would like to involve also Long in the discussion, because I know that you have a quite extensive uh, uh, knowledge on the 14 five years plan. I took some uh, notes that uh, I would like later on to share with you in order to have uh, a bit more uh, discussion, because you mentioned among others, the quality of life that uh, is linked with uh, uh, also the improvement of the environment and the sustainability in the production. And I was just checking also other news regarding the problem of uh, production that some automotive companies who are having here in China for the cheap shortage, which can be semiconductor problem, which can be also some uh, uh, material that it can be uh, interesting to, to see how it will develop. Long. Do you want to make some comments? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Dan, for the uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I think, I, I mean, Dan, I agree a lot you know, on this five-year plan and uh, especially uh, this whole uh, emphasis on uh, securities, like, you know, food security, supply chain security, and energy security. And uh, we did see, like, among the five-year plan targets, there are several targets like quite new, for example, the energy security. Uh, I don't think they mentioned it in the 13th five-year plan. Well, in the 14th five-year plan, they, not only they mentioned it, but they made it uh, a binding target. I mean, for example, for example, not every target in the five-year plan is a binding target. Some are indicative, uh, you know, GDP growth target, while well, everyone put a lot of emphasis on, is actually just an indicative target. The binding targets usually like, involve like energy, and the climate uh, uh, and this stuff. And for the first time, I think that they mentioned like energy production as a binding target. And they also uh, talk about uh, a few other things. But I'm, I'm a little bit curious about like this whole drive about energy security because uh, it looks to me very, very difficult. Uh, and people say, you know, the reason why Beijing is pushing so hard on this uh, new energy vehicle and other stuff 
that is drive is because China wants to move away from the dependence on like crude oil imports, right? Because like 75% or so of the uh, oil China consumes is from imports. And there are always people like speculating or, or concerned about you know, this kind of uh, dependence. And people say, oh, this is probably why like Beijing wants us to use you know, electric vehicles instead of you know, using uh, 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 petrol, right? But then again, I look up the other day, uh, the lithium battery, because most of the electric vehicles are using lithium battery. And then I, I, I was looking uh, up and then so how much China uh, relies on uh, lithium imports. And then I figured over 50% of lithium is also imported. So, okay, you tell people now to drive uh, cars that use uh, petrols, and they're driving cars using battery, and then the batteries are made of uh, some kind of mineral you have to also import. So is there really a way that Beijing can succeed in like achieving whatever kind of energy securities that some policymakers have in their mind? Yeah, and this question, I think, to me, it's always about uh, diversifying the sources of those energy imports. It looks like China has invested a lot in acquiring overseas assets. Uh, in the beginning, like for agriculture, for example, they acquire a lot of land. And for minerals, uh, buy, buy up their mines uh, in Latin America, in Africa. But it just seems like this strategy has run into a bottleneck. Uh, these regions are usually quite costly to operate and there's the geopolitical risk is rising and then um, the overseas acquisition of many of those things got uh, have been uh, blocked if uh, there are some geopolitical tensions like with Australia with Brazil um, so I think in the future maybe there are two different directions one is to increase, really increase the investment domestically for exploration of the new energy. Uh, and we've seen a lot of efforts in Xinjiang area yeah. uh, to discover more in domestic market. But at the same time, there's also a different strategy on uh, China instead of just invest directly to those overseas land mines and stuff, and they are trying to acquire the whole supply chain, like the logistics, the trade, or just being a stakeholder for some of the overseas uh, company in, in energy sector. So to resolve the energy security once and for all, I don't think there is any easy solution. And trying to reduce oil dependence just by switching all cars to uh, new energy vehicles, I don't think that's the ultimate solution either. Mm -hmm. Right, so it doesn't look like a, that as easy as I mean, it, it may seem, or I, or I don't think it, it, it seems easy at all, right? Uh, also on this supply chain thing, I mean, obviously, I think, I think the, the, the big logic uh, has changed since the starting of the US-China like rivalry that, you know, just President Xi suddenly realized, you know, there's a lot of weakness China has in this own economy and supply chain is one of them, right? If a few people in Washington decide, you know, they will not sell anything to a Chinese company, then that Chinese company will get close to death in a couple of years. Uh, I think this gets really scary for him and that's why he's pushing so hard on uh, supply chain. And then he started this uh, bundle system and basically asking all local governments, all universities and uh, a lot of central SOEs as well as private sectors. Uh, to work on sectors uh, that he thinks China needs the most. And I, and I fully agree with that, that you know, it's, it's, it's a thing uh, switching from, you know, I think in the past 10 years, China did very well in the, I would call it soft tech, right? The internet companies, you know, e-commerce, delivery, and a few, a FinTech, a few others, but none of this is, is hard. And I think President Xi probably has something in his mind that China needs hard tech and he need, we need it now. Right, and so by do, achieving that, I think he needs capital, you know, not only state capital, but also private capital and foreign capital to help him. And probably this is why he came up with a phrase that prevent the disorderly expansion of capital. Because in his mind, there's something called disorderly expansion and to the opposite, then there must be something called orderly expansion. So what is orderly and what is not orderly? And I said, I agree with Dan that probably if you invest in hard tech, 
like invest as uh, semiconductors, invest in chips, new energy vehicle, uh, minerals, or even food. And this is probably something he thinks capital should go. And then if you just spend millions of dollars uh, making on the street advertisement and telling all the kids to go to after class tutoring, and this is of course these other expansion and he wants to kill all of them. Uh, you know, and the, 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 but then the question is, is this strategy going to be uh, uh, that successful or like, you know, or will private capital and foreign capital do exactly what he wished for? Because I think the only problem with capital going to hard tech is that it's not making a lot of money in the short run. Because if you invest in soft tech, you know, the, the business model is very simple, right? You're successful and then you copy paste, you do massive advertisements, marketing, and then you start to have hundreds of thousands of users, millions of users, tens of millions of users, and you became you came from nothing to some giant in two or three years. But if you want to build a factory, you probably it will probably take you two years to get the factory done, and uh, and there's still seven years from you uh, launching your product, and uh, uh, let long like you making your product very advanced, right? So uh, is that going to be really successful? Yeah, it's funny when you uh, when you look at how disappointed the central authorities are with where the capital where the capitalists are going in china so they want to divert uh, more capital into the technology sector like you said but then they're running the risk of reducing the total amount of capital that will flow into this sector uh, as a whole so i don't think um i don't think that in the future, the platform companies can have uh, nearly as an easier life as before. But for private capital to flow into the, the area, the emerging industry that, that the, the government want, it's going to be almost impossible unless there's some, uh, there, there's some like forced measure. So most of the capital I think will still be from either directly state backed uh, institutions like banks, or um, the SOEs will be required to take on some of the responsibilities. And for a lot of the new investment, uh, when I look at the 14th five-year plan, it will be concentrated in R&D. And the universities, uh, those funding sources look like are entirely from uh, the local government. And some of them will be from companies, uh, the listed companies in China, um, but how to maintain a high valuation or a, a healthy growth for their business is another problem. Um, because now we see this chaotic response from the capital market. People are sort of losing faith in a way, at least in the short term, on where this market is going. Um, I'm not sure what more stabilizing measures that the government can come up with. But if the hope is that people will continue their confidence, uh, continue to hold their confidence on China's economic growth, there probably have to be more, more liberalized measures rather than just, um, just you can do this, you can do that. There has to be more like a negative list uh, type of measures in my head instead of like banning gaming or banning the online education platform. I don't think those measures will work. Right. Uh, I think well, the one last question, I mean, on this very hot topic about uh, common prosperity, uh, you know, uh, the following that document uh, just released a few days ago, uh, you know, at the Central Economic and uh, Financial uh, uh, Committee. Um, you know, obviously we, we do think, you know, President Xi cares and is very concerned about inequality uh, in China, uh, um, truly from his heart. Uh, but the thing is, when we have to elaborate on okay, what kind of policy uh, the government will introduce to achieve common prosperity, right? Of course, we have this uh, special zone in Zhejiang that they want to be uh, like a, a pilot zone for common prosperity. But a lot of the policies, for example, the tax policies uh, cannot be done by local governments, right? So it must be from central level. But I think it seems a little bit strange to me that the discussion I heard uh, just over the last two or three days is all about raising tax, right? People thought, oh, there must be a chance that China will introduce an inheritance tax. 
And then trying to say, some people say, oh, there will be a bigger launch of property tax, more than just the pilot programs in Shanghai or Chongqing. There'll be a more widespread uh, of, uh, of property tax. Some people talk about uh, a capital gain tax, because now if you make money from the stock market, I mean, these revenues, you don't have to pay tax, right? Because uh, right now the individual income tax is more or less a salary tax, right? So it will be a capital gain tax. But the strange thing is all about raising tax. So then the question some people ask, not just me, uh, feel like, oh, is this making people equally poor? Or you want to make people equally rich? Uh, so I guess my question is, do you think you know, there will be some measures from Beijing to further reduce tax for the poor or a middle class? or there will be some greater transfer of wealth from the top uh, to the middle and bottom, and not just raising you know, tax uh, for the rich. So China only has about 5% uh, of the population paying individual income tax. That's extremely low. So even if we tax the richest of those 5%, it's a very little money. And giving that to poor people, I don't think that would do much. Um, and the discussion about raising taxes is a bit uh, disturbing to me because in economics, raising taxes cause a lot of distortions. So eventually it has to be reflected in either like rising costs for doing business or rising costs for living. Um, and it won't be really the companies or government bearing those costs. It is the families, uh, consumers, they will bear the fundamental cost of those, of those taxes. And I don't think the common prosperity means we want the rich people to get poorer. Um, but the income inequality right now is mostly driven by the poor people's income not growing fast enough to catch up. So then the key focus should be how to make them richer faster rather than how to make the rich people poorer faster. I think that's, that's, that should be the starting point when we do this discussion. I, I do talk to uh, quite a number of experts in um, like income uh, demo, uh, demographers. So they are looking at this issue as a fundamental issue for China, uh, social equality will be the most important goal in the coming decades. Um, but the way to achieve that is probably to first start with wealth equality rather than income equality. I think that's maybe part of the reason why there's so much stress in uh, stabilizing the housing market. Uh, since China's market, as we all know it, it's two markets. So the big city housing market, it's the rising, rising, and the rest of China, the housing market always run the risk of collapsing. So it is relatively easy to control the, um, the surging price in tier one cities, just forbidden people to buy it. But when it comes to holding up the price in small cities, it is rather difficult. And when that happens, like you said, like well, if we raise property tax to an even higher level, that probably will hurt the poorer region or those re uh, inland region a lot more than uh, those big cities in coastal areas. So I really don't think the property tax will be implemented anytime soon. The framework might be established in, uh, in the 14th five-year plan era, but the implementation and eventually the local government actually can depend on property tax as a steady stream of income, of revenue. Uh, I think it's going to take probably beyond like 2035 vision. Uh, it's not feasible. And the capital gain tax is even more risky, um, more risky uh, tax to, to start uh, to try. Uh, the stock market in China is still relatively small, uh, given how large the GDP is. Um, and there are a lot of uh, hope in the stock market. Like the central government has high hopes for the stock market to finance its uh, um, high tech industry to help China to achieve a lot of the social transition goals. So the hope is to um, prop up the stock market rather than um, to depress the transaction in this market. We know that the, like, 
um, the retail uh, the retail buyers in China stock market are dominant. So they will be uh, totally devastated if there's this capital gain tax. So yeah. I think if the capital gain tax is introduced today on Monday, we have the whole market in the down. <laughs> I think so, so. Uh, but then the thing is, I mean, I, I just got a feeling that, you know, the policy uh, introduction is now very fast. And then the transmission mechanism from the top to the working level is very quick. Uh, for example, they, at the same meeting, they also talk about resolving financial risks, right? And a day after that, we had Huarong coming up with this uh, big uh, statement saying, okay, what exactly we're going to do? We're going to have strategic investors like leading, uh, led by Citigroup and a few others. And then uh, yesterday we had Evergrande uh, in a sermon by PBOC and CBRC. And also obviously, these two uh, uh, statements, uh, you know, they just happened right after uh, President Xi chaired this uh, uh, very high level meeting uh, uh, on, on two subjects, right? Resolving financial risk, we saw results in two days. So comments prosperity, how long, you know, can we wait before we see some uh, like uh, detailed policies? I think will be very, very quick. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly the risks. I think now the implementation is really too fast. It's <laughs> So if you look at uh, how policies were done, like the 1994, there was the tax reform, a huge tax reform. And there was strong pushback from the provincial government, from the even lower level government. So the, the Chinese government is not like one government. It's a lot of different pieces. But right now, it just seems like when central government issue a idea or see express an idea, all like everyone pitch in, like compete. They compete so much in coming up with the strictest uh, regulations or more rules. And that's quite worrying. We know that local government have been this um, amplifier for central policies. And if, it's, if it reach, reaches another level, uh, I think it's very dangerous for, um, for, for the growth in coming years. Right. I mean, you, since you mentioned girls, I think I'm going to ask just one last question and then I'll hand, hand over to Carlo and the audience. Uh, I think a few important policies were introduced over the last uh, 12 months, right? Uh, number one, you have this carbon peak, carbon neutral policies, you know, trying to have to move away from the heavy polluting, you know, and the high carbon emission company, uh, uh, you know, sectors. And they're very big, right? So if you tell Shanxi to stop producing coal, you know, this growth impact will be very, very negative, right? But of course it's over long term. And then you have uh, this, uh, you know, uh, inequality, you know, people talk about wealth redistribution, uh, commons prosperity, uh, doesn't look like very uh, pro growth, right? And then you have another out of the policies, this whole crackdown against, you know, tech, uh, soft tech, I would say, you know, internet uh, uh, giants, which is again, not very pro growth. Right, so it looks like all the major policies we have since last year, you know, since China sort of controlled COVID, none of that put economic growth as the priority. And you know, quite on the contrary, it seems that this government or president himself is prioritizing a lot of other things over growth. So as you said, you know, of course they, they, they didn't set a very ambitious target, I mean, depending on what you think, like one only want to double GDP in the next 15 years, but with a declining like uh, uh, population uh, on the cards in the 50 years and uh, Beijing rushing with policies, not pro growth at all. So is that really the case? The government has fundamentally changed that they no longer care that much about growth. Because in the past, you know, the Chinese government was famous about like putting growth ahead of everything. But it seems that that trend has been changing, right? We talk more about quality over quantity. But I, I just saw over the past 12 months, we seem to be on a accelerating path away from growth towards anything but growth. And I remember the time when I was uh, doing grad school in the US, the hottest topic back then was the overheating of Chinese economy. That's before the Beijing Olympics. So for years it was overheating and then high growth. But even now the number the growth number is still quite good, it's the fastest in the world. So uh, I've read your article about the growth forecast till 2035. So on average, 
every year we have to have like 4.7 percent of growth. So people are talking about the deceleration of China's growth rate in coming decade, but there's a actually a high possibility that at some point it might accelerate. So this transition from manufacturing to services and then to innovation-based economy, in many areas, it can cause this really um, like add-on effect to the previous productivities. So if we look at the productive growth trajectory, there are some downside risks, uh, of course, because uh, like aging, um, but then the human capital is really getting quite deep in China. The talent pool is expanding. We have so many engineers. And in the future, for the next 20 years, it will be the digital economy that's powering this economy, uh, that's powering this growth. And then we see this, um, uh, this uh, uh, new trend of using, say, like digital currency or revolutionize some of the banking sector of the business. Um, so when those things happen, it will fundamentally change how people trade, uh, how people do business and do transactions. So that's the whole change in the credit system. So I, I think maybe we're seeing a downward trend for growth now, but there, there are this, um, there's this implicit goal of a, a certain point, like what I said, I think China is on this upward trend of its new business cycle. At some point, it can and very likely to accelerate. And on average, we'll probably see an even faster growth by 2035. Thank you. Thank you, Long. Thank you, uh, Dan. It was a really interesting discussion that I didn't want to in, uh, interrupt. But uh, we have many questions received from uh, our uh, numerous attendees. And, uh, but I want to get continue to discuss about human uh, capital because uh, we didn't mention one foreigners we didn't mention uh, foreign direct investment so you know in shanghai now we have this uh, uh, talk of the town that there will be a new social insurance payment that will start the city in january you will have a new individual income tax uh, so you have a closed border. You were mentioned about local government be stricter and stricter in order to please Beijing. In fact, we have a cross border. We cannot bring back our kids and many of our family. So it is still place to be for foreigners or we shall look to relocate somewhere else. So for foreigners, I think uh, the challenge now is that uh, many foreigners don't feel welcomed in China. It seems that um, part of it is because they were treated uh, like domestic companies. So they encounter the same hardships that domestic companies are facing. So those preferential treatment are gone. But then on top of that, there's still the uncertainty about whether investing in China still makes sense. Um, we talk a lot about the decoupling story after the trade war. And it just seems that now the decoupling is happening. Like we don't talk about it as much as before. But then when you look at technology, the supply chain, once this COVID is, uh, is controlled, then those things will be back in the discussion. Um, I don't think foreigners should leave China anytime soon but like many of our clients are doing. So they're thinking about alternative strategies. So many of them are the domestic companies. They're setting up supply chain uh, production lines in other countries, like closer to markets. But for many of those companies, they're in the upstream or midstream uh, section of the supply chain. When it comes to the consumer products uh, like NEV or electronics or high-end electronics, Many of them have realized eventually uh, trade depend on trade of those things depend on trust. But Europe and the US do not have that kind of trust to China since all those products use data, they collect data. Um, maybe the biggest trade in the future will be concentrated in those parts or intermediate goods. But for the final consumer goods, you have to have separate lines, like one line for the rich world that those countries have problem with China and one specifically for China, just tap into this market. 
And that just seems to me become a more and more like a new reality. Thank you, thank you. And um, regarding uh, security, security of energy, food, we were discussing, we may see that China in this sector is looking to have a, a more important and leading role in uh, fair policies, because we have seen uh, the big investment in soya beans plantation in Latin America, as you mentioned, big investment uh, in pipelines. And now it seems that also in Afghanistan, one of the main uh, investors will be China, especially for the, uh, all this raw material for battery lithium and uh, so on. So China is uh, going global, not only with companies, but also with policies. Oh yeah. Uh, China is truly embracing globalization. And among a lot, all the large economies, China probably is only one, uh, for a good reason, of course. I think a, uh, I've heard several talks in the past uh, from Chinese policymakers about leveraging the overseas market, especially the Belt and Road markets, to guarantee the food security. But then the funny thing about this is that countries along the Belt and Road I'll have the highest the food security problem. It's usually the food safety problem, like the African swine fever. It was very likely, according to report by Chinese Academy of Agricultural Sciences, it's because of smuggling of pork from Russia into China. That's how it has been imported, this kind of virus imported in China. And for some of uh, the commodities like soybean or corn, the largest the producer and also the cheapest producer are still in America, uh, like Canada, uh, the US, and for Brazil and Argentina, they are now the main exporters of those feed stuff to China, but it's not enough. So we look at the, uh, the number one document of uh, um, from last year, oh no, no, for, from this year. I think it's in February or March, I forgot. So there are a lot of talks about developing China's animal industry. So that's not just restricted to pig or, uh, or beef, it's like across the board. So that means China have to import a lot more of those beef stuff than before. And relying on the Belt and Road countries, of course, uh, there can be some efforts, but still uh, there needs to be a good relationship with the traditional big producers like the Th US. Thank you. Listen, I'm gonna now take uh, one of the questions just arrived from our attendees. That the question for them. Uh, before China released the 14th Fabius Plan, President Xi, uh, cited the importance of building up an independent economy in many occasions. He proposed a new concept of dual circulation, for example, that you were mentioned uh, le, le, early on. For example, which place the R&D in the first place and how this uh, would impact uh, the multinational sector from the tech sector operating in China, for example. The tech sector, like foreign, sorry, the foreign tech uh, investment, you mean foreign investors in tech sector in China, yeah? Yes. Um, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, because it, like I said, I think the decoupling is happening and Chinese government have very different views about data from many of the Western governments. So the data is bounded by the, the boundary of the country. So the companies don't own data. And we are seeing some major release of um, the, the data related laws, uh, like the data protection law, uh, data security law, the information protection law. Uh, they are all passed. And I remember they're going to be implemented. Uh, at least the data security law being implemented next month. So yeah. Today, yeah. today the uh, information protection law. Yeah? So once there are more clarities, I think then companies would understand how to treat data in China, then they will have better opportunity to succeed. But before then, I really don't think there's 
much opportunities for foreign investors, except in the case of technological collaboration. Um, but I understand that there's a lot of opposition from foreign companies. Uh, and they still need to partner with a Chinese company uh, in order to get into the Chinese market. Um, it is just going to be a lot more difficult for anyone to make China, to make money in China. That's probably the morality. Yeah. Thank you. And said from the chief economist of uh, a bank, this sounds really scary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm joking. <laughs> Please, uh, we were discussing about this is the first time in the 14th, five years plan, we don't have a target of growth. And uh, this how will impact uh, on the local government and uh, on uh, their uh, KPI. Will they deliver as good as before or we can see a bigger differentiation uh, from uh, different geographical areas? Oh, this is a long, or Dan, please, if you want to answer long like this, Dan, get a breath, or if not, we continue with Dan. <laughs> How they will manage to see who is the good uh, uh, local uh, uh, authorities who performing well if uh, we don't know which target they should reach for the growth, for example. Well, if I may uh, jump in a little bit, I, I do think the importance of GDP growth is uh, declining uh, in this whole evaluation matrix. Uh, I think the government governments are like evaluated based on a lot of things, right? Most recently, as we know, right, COVID uh, policies are probably the number one, right? If you fail to contain uh, the cases in your own jurisdiction, you get punished, right? Usually we get the uh, the health official removed and the vice mayor in charge of health uh, sector get punished or warned. And even the number one or number two, like the party secretary and the, the mayor are at risk of being blamed, right? So for them, right, they could of course sacrifice economic growth for something much greater uh, for Beijing, which like in this case is COVID. And I think, you know, we have other cases like uh, energy intensity, right? Energy intensity and the whole carbon policies Look, looks like they are very important, right? We had uh, NDRC doing these quarterly checks of uh, energy uh, intensity targets. And they just said, I think a few days ago that several pro provinces failed in uh, uh, reducing energy intensity in the first uh, half of this year. Uh, so these officials will be blamed. And uh, I think when this uh, whole common prosperity thing comes out, you know, if you fail to deliver that, I'm not sure whether there will be like a Gini coefficient for every province. And if you fail on that, you get punished. And for the uh, pollution, we have had that for, for a long time, right? Especially in Northern China, Hebei, Shandong, Shanxi, right? All the prefecture level cities have a ranking of pollution based on PM 2.5, right? The city ranking the last in a year, and uh, usually that party secretary and mayor get blamed and you don't get promotion for several years, right? So I think we're just over the past five years, we increasingly get more and more elements uh, not related to girls or counter girls into this whole evaluation matrix as, as a way that you know, Beijing is incentivizing local governments not just focus on girls, but focused on a lot of other stuff. And we, I think we're seeing more and more of these uh, uh, in the factors, uh, mm -hmm. so and which dilutes the importance of GDP growth. Thank yeah. you. Dan, you want to say something about it? I just add a small point. Yes, I've seen this sound quite similar to how the government treated um, the school district housing. So it has been less important than before, but still it's part of the weight of how your kids are getting into important school. I'm saying so the school district housing is still important, but not as important as before. But as long as it's part of the weight in getting your kids into a good school, then parents will still buy it. So I think the local government still would value GDP growth a lot, just yeah. maybe not before. Yeah. Yes, thank you. We have one uh, question from uh, one of our attendees to say, uh, I would like uh, to discuss uh, on the real social situation of the country and what can come out of it. 
probably this is what is driving the recent release of government wealth redistribution issue. And what else than tax do that in a reasonable, acceptable, and the most time scale? We can do it in order to improve the social situation in China. <laughs> Crystal ball. Wow, it's a social situation. Uh... One thing could be also readdress the problem of the farmland, which is uh, uh, the last one who was uh, discussing about it was Wen Jiangbao. Since then, nobody touched it anymore, since 10 years ago. <laughs> Please, you mm -hmm. said it free. Uh, five years plan. So you may remember that he was one of the big horse of the former prime minister. Please. Yeah. So agricultural reform uh, was a was a big accomplishment for Wen Jiabao. So he got a lot of credit for that. After that, it's getting more difficult because I think it's similar to like the Hukou reform or the financial reform. There's no such thing as a regional reform anymore. Whatever you do now, it has to go national and it will have outsized influence on all level of government. So I think that's why there is a lack of incentive for government officials to push forward those, um, those reforms. And even for the education reform, we have seen like several rounds in the past decade, nothing was achieved and the burdens for children were increasing rather than decreasing. So this time there's really a big hit from the central government trying to like correct this in a drastic way. And for Hukou reform as well, there has been strong opposition from the police department. And that's quite unusual for many because people tend to think that Chinese government is like a one piece, but it's not. Like different departments have different interests and it's hard to balance uh, at this point. So to resolve the social problems in China, I do think the fundamental thing is still growth. Uh, there's no target now, but that doesn't mean there's no implicit target. Um, improving the quality of life means there has to be more consumption and better services. And the government is doing a lot now on reducing the, uh, the cost of governing like, by going digital. So uh, there's also less corruption on the grassroots level. When people have uh, business to do with the government, everyone would find it a lot easier than before. So that is improvement and the government deserves credit. So there are a lot of improvements like this. It's just not really in the money terms. So not really reflected in the income or wealth, but still it's improving people's welfare. So I think that counts too. Thank you. Long, do you want to mention something? about uh, this uh, interesting uh, final point. In a communist country, the distribution of wealth is a main point. And how do you believe we can give a, a further suggestion? You know, I had a uh, you know, discussion with a you know, friend the other day and uh, you know, something he uh, came up with that looks like the economic policies are now are looking uh, more and more uh, like European policies, and especially the European conservative policies. It's like you know the uh, you know the top wants a very large and reliable corporate sector uh, that you know can they can depend on and they can produce things uh, whenever Beijing feels needed. And this was you know happening during COVID, right? Basically, you know Beijing told the local SOEs in Wuhan to fully open. And uh, you know they were producing like COVID-related goods at uh, a time of emergency, and thus um, you know President Xi drew a conclusion that this was only possible because we had you know, strong control over these companies. So he wants this he wants this uh, a large corporate sector that really follows his policy very closely. At the same time, I think he's uh, you know giving a little putting a little bit more control, right? He's moving uh, I think uh, a little bit further from like a. a more uh, Anglo-Saxon type of uh, you know, corporate model uh, that you know basically the corporate ha has a lot more flexibility uh, uh, and can uh, decide basically uh, to do whatever they can or, or they want, right? In, in the Chinese case, it looks like you no, know, not really. You know, you 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 can't just do whatever you want to do. 
and you have to do things that Beijing wants to do, right? So uh, it's kind of this uh, model. And, uh, you know, so and it's also somehow interesting that over the past few months, I would say, you know, we, we hear media and some uh, and the Chinese top scholars uh, mentioning a Germany a, a lot more open, than, uh, a lot more often than they used to. I mean, I saw that you mentioned a few media as well, the foreign media also pick up, right? People talk, you know, we should look at how Germany developed its own manufacturing. We should look at how Germany, uh, uh, you know, uh, trained its uh, workers. We should look at how Germany regulates the property market. And someone even says, you know, how we should look at how Germany regulates the banks. Although I'm not sure the German banks are really good examples, you know. Uh, so, you know, it looks like the Beijing is really shifting the focus more and more away from like, you know, the previous model and looking at, at a somewhat a new model that it hopes uh, to learn something from. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we arrived to the end of this uh, webinar. It's uh, always uh, so interesting to discuss uh, with you along with Dan. Thank you so much for the comprehensive uh, discussion. Thank you our attendees and the chamber to organize uh, this event. Inside China is a series of webinar and event that help us to understand better the economy and the geopolitical that is behind the policy. And uh, for this is everything. If you have any question, please uh, send an email uh, to our uh, uh, office in uh, Beijing, and we will try to uh, send to Long and uh, to them. And uh, for today is everything. We're going to meet again next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.